This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. All right, welcome to the show. So much to talk about in just a short amount of time, but you know, somehow, some way, we always manage. Yep. So without further delay, say hello to the one, the only, mm. Mr. Kenny Berger. Ah, oh, you're too kind, Ray. Yeah, coming up, it's off to our nation's capital, where Georgia's young farmers and ranchers were given the chance to plead their case to lawmakers. We'll also take an in-depth look at the ag issues currently being talked about on the Hill. Also on the program, the Monitor visits the University of Georgia golf course and learns how the course superintendent cares for the course and manages the landscaping around it. Plus. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick standing on top of the brew house here in Athens, Georgia. We're talking about the agricultural side of making beer and we're hanging out at the Southern Brewing Company this month. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. That and a whole lot more starts right now on the Farm Monitor. Well, it's that time of year again, time for the Georgia Farm Bureau's Young Farmers and Ranchers annual trip to D.C., where they get to be advocates for the industry by meeting with legislators and talking about big issues affecting them, like the Farm Bill, trade, and infrastructure. John Holcomb was there and has more. From the moment the plane touched down in D.C., the young farmers and ranchers from Georgia had a very busy couple of days ahead of them. Each minute is a valuable one, as they get the chance to meet with legislators and let their voices be heard to the ones that represent them. Us as young farmers want to have a voice up here um, because everything we do is taking over the next generation of farming or business. So we're trying to, you know, get to see where policies are affecting us or are going to affect us. So, you know, we feel like what we need to say should be heard. Um, and, and I feel like it is a good trip for us to be heard on. When they come to Washington, they realize what an important role they can play by uh, being here in person, talking to congressmen and senators, and being able to uh, realize that there is a place that their voice can be heard. The trip couldn't have come at a better time, as several big issues are being discussed on the Hill that could directly affect anyone in ag. One of those big issues, of course, is the Farm Bill, and members got to hear from AFBF lobbyist Dale Moore as he spoke about how the Farm Bill could be completed quickly due to the upcoming midterms as those members up for re-election want to get their work accomplished. The policy issues are a lot of those things have been worked on over the past couple of years. Both committees have spent, you know, over hours and hours, days even, uh, in various hearings, town hall meetings, listening sessions. So one of the things that we know is they've got a good handle on how they're going to work with the policy, how they're going to meet the budget challenges that they're going to work with. Trade was also a big topic as NAFTA negotiations have been underway. Senator David Perdue had a meet and greet with the group and talked about some issues including trade. He reassured the group that they know how important trade is to ag and that their interests are the top priority at the negotiating table. The president knows now uh, the relationship that the ag community has in the NAFTA uh, agreement and so he's going to be very careful with that. What we're trying to do is protect American workers, American industries at the same time developing closer uh, working and trading relationships with our trading partners like Mexico and Canada. We also got the chance to talk with Senator Perdue about infrastructure. In order for the ag industry to be successful, infrastructure needs to be up to date. Here in Georgia, roads have already seen repair, but the next big thing is broadband to be able to connect to the world digitally. Uh, I met this week with the Georgia Department of Transportation folks. They are on it. Uh, I think there's a way to combine our interstate layout of our interstate highways with broadband uh, piping to get uh, capability into these rural communities. We know that's a big deal. Another part of rural development, having a steady workforce. Senator Perdue talked about the importance of revising the H-2A law and how it will help rural communities in Georgia and all over the country. We know we've got to attract workers back into those areas. So in the ag community, we know that the H-2A uh, law has got to be revised. We're working on that. And we know that, uh, that if, you, if you give people an opportunity to make a decent living, the rural communities will thrive, and they're, and, and they're thriving right now. Reporting in Washington for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. In other ag news, the American Farm Bureau Federation says USDA made the right decision to withdraw the organic livestock and poultry practices rule. 
Public Policy Executive Director Dale Moore says that if implemented, the rule would have been very costly for organic producers who raise cows, chickens, and other livestock. According to Moore, had the rule gone into effect, it would have forced a number of organic producers to change their production practices and likely would have forced many of them either out of the organic sector, if not out of business entirely. Secretary Purdue and Undersecretary Greg Ibach have both made the point that the existing robust organic livestock regulations are effective. It doesn't mean that they can't take a look at some changes, but we strongly believe that the Secretary's action, the Undersecretary's action, kept these rules inside the law. We believe that this is also a signal that they're looking at this organic process as being something that they take very seriously and will be working to ensure it's a label that consumers can count on and the rules and the process will be transparent so that producers who've invested a lot of time and resources and certainly their own capital to make their operations meet these standards pay off the end of the day. Meantime, designed by famed architect Robert Trent Jones, the University of Georgia golf course is recognized as one of the top college courses in the nation. It's a reputation earned in large part because of all the work put in by its groundkeeping staff and their relationship with the UGA turf grass program. We take a lot of pride. We feel like uh, we've done a good job of putting the face of the university out there and representing the university. And we just strive to try to get better every year to push that number to get just to get even better to 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 make the university proud of what we do. Now a lot of what we do is behind the scenes because we get 80% of our work done before before the customers even see us. Now it's not to say we're not out here when they're here. We're here, but we're just ahead of them, trying to get everything done ahead of play. And at the University of Georgia Golf Course, it's easier for me than maybe a normal golf course because I hire a lot of students and they. They, a lot of them work in the morning, so I'm able to stack up in the mornings and get a lot of stuff done in front of play. We're able to test our grasses, which we develop at the research farm, but our conditions aren't exactly like they are in the real world, say on a golf course here. So to have Scott to test them and grow them on the golf course with golfers, with wear, with traffic, with all the conditions that happen out here that may not happen on a research farm just makes my job easier and hopefully makes me more successful in the future. We serve as a great place for them to come and, and do research, but they're always someone that you can look back on and, and ask them if you ever need help, you ever have a question. These guys are experts in their field, they're leaders in their field, so it's really nice having them close and have that partnership with them. So we're looking at trying to solve problems, and on a golf course that might be uh, making a greens grass easier to manage at really low heights so the golfer has quick speeds that are consistent. It also could be making a drought tolerant grass that uses less water. I develop probably 5,000 new hybrids every year, uh, most of which are gonna fail. And Scott has been on the receiving end of that, testing grasses that we thought may work in the real world and they haven't. But he's always been patient with me and supportive and working with him is gonna help me uh, develop grasses that are more sustainable in the future. Well, we wanna look in the environment first, you know, what kind of environment we're gonna put it in. Are we putting it in shade? Are we putting it in full sun? Or are we putting it in a high traffic area and things like that? Uh, I'd say 50% of our golf courses have bent grass, uh, creeping bent grass on their greens, which is a cool season grass. Uh, the other half have Bermuda grass greens. So we're dom predominantly Bermuda grass and warm season turf grass in this area, in this region. It all boils down to conditioning of the golf course. How well is that golf course conditioned? So the, the cleaner, the tighter, the faster, it, we keep it, the, the happier the customer is ultimately going to be. Oh, it's the best feeling in the world knowing that your hard work and the work of your team and to have something actually work that could help uh, make something easier for a golf course superintendent or to make golf better for a, for a golfer that's out here, it just brings you that satisfaction and it makes you feel like you've, uh, your work has led to a good accomplishment. It's tough because we only close about five days a year and so and we have tea times from sun up to sundown. Uh, so our, our key is to try to stay ahead of things. We try to try to stay ahead in the morning and get the most we can in the morning done because in the afternoons you just never know if the weather's really good. We're going to have to work somewhere else where the customers aren't because there's just not a lot of room. So it's a challenge. One day is not the same as another. Uh, I love being outside. Uh, I, I can either be in the office or I can be outside. I get my own choice uh, depending on the day, but I do like the variability of it and, and, and it, the, every day not being the same. Hey everybody, Ranger Nick, SBC, Southern Brewing Company here in Athens. Why am I here and what does it have to do with agriculture? I got the fascinating insight on the other side of the break.
Destructive wildfires have increased dramatically in recent years, but fire is a natural part of the landscape. So what can we do to help communities adapt? Living with wildfire is about making changes before a wildfire happens. It's about creating safe and resilient communities where fire plays its natural role without destroying lives and property. And it's about supporting effective wildfire response. How can we get there? As a nation, we spend a lot of time and money suppressing wildfires to protect homes and communities. The practice of putting out nearly all wildfires keeps us on a long and challenging road. Large fires put firefighters at risk, burn homes, degrade water quality, and cost billions of dollars. There are many efforts underway to build a better path to help communities adapt to wildfire, but threatening fires make us scramble and spend a lot of money reacting, then rebuilding after an event instead of proactively addressing the problem. What can we do to break this cycle? The Wiry team is helping communities build a path to fire adaptation paved with strong researcher-practitioner partnerships, applied social science, and wise investments. Our diverse team gathers local information about communities, the residents who live there, fire risk to their properties, and what they think about wildfire. Wiry uses this information to create plans for fire adaptation based on the unique characteristics and strengths of communities. The work is in-depth and the community is front and center. The partners involved understand and are invested in the community and the positive changes are effective and long-lasting. We know this approach is effective and can be replicated in fire-prone communities around the nation because we've seen success firsthand. A fire chief we worked with said, Based on our partnership with the Wiry team, we've learned a ton. The perception of the public and access to information was different from what we originally thought. With the addition of a social science component, we recognize a need for change in how we communicate, educate, and participate. Together, we're connected to an enormous network and are sharing what we're learning along the way. We can't do this alone. Partnerships and community interactions are key to the success of this approach. To find out how Wiry can help your community, please contact us at www wildfireresearchcenter.org Now in his fifth year as a contributor to the show, Ranger Nick's adventures have taken him to many cool and interesting places. Yeah, this month he checks in from a local brewery. Not a bad way to celebrate five years, or maybe it's his way of dealing with us. Kidding, of course. Actually, this is the honest truth. It was all in the name of science and agriculture. Well, hey everybody, I am no mad scientist, and I know as we approach the 50th Ranger, Nick, this is not going to be the one that comes off the rails. I'm standing in what looks like a chemistry lab out here at Southern Brewing Company, and I'm standing with Brian Roth. Brian, good to meet Cheers. you. Good to meet you, Nick. Good to meet you. Co-owner out here at Southern Brewing Company. Brian, explain to me why we're standing in what looks like a chemistry lab and what this has to do with making beer here in Athens. So, um... Ironically, this is kind of the crux of everything we do. This is where everything starts. So people don't think of beer as being as scientific as it can be. It's very artisanal. We do a lot of stuff with recipes, but yeast is kind of the driving force of everything we do. So I would say the yeast is probably 75% mm. of beer. It's the aroma, it's the flavor, it's how much alcohol ends up being in there. It's even how the CO2 kind of sets in the beer. So all this equipment is really geared towards us trying to make the best food or the best place or environment for yeast to kind of grow and prosper in so that we get the qualities that we want on the backside. So it takes, a, it takes a good bit of science. And it looks like it, and I've heard that the yeast mm -hmm. in the brews that you use here at Southern Brewing Company is a locally grown mm -hmm. yeast. Is that true? That's true. We do use okay. a commercial yeast for a big chunk of our beers, but we caught a wild yeast off of an azalea uh, here on the property before we cleared it. And then we caught a wild yeast off of a Cherokee rose. Wow. Those two we just call wild azalea and Cherokee rose because um, we're not very creative probably. But uh, that's good. <laughs> um, it was an accident. They were the state flowers, so that was nice. But we get completely different qualities from them. So we uh, house those currently at the University of Georgia. They were caught by myself and Dr. Jeff Rapp, who's head of microbiology at Athens Tech. And then we use Dr. Lanzalotta at the University of Georgia and Dr. Bloom uh, to help us process these yeasts. They store them for us so okay. we can continue to use them um, and we don't have to keep going back to the source. Interesting. Well, we talk a lot about Georgia Grown on the monitor. I want to talk about what's next and that's making this stuff, taking the yeast, producing this beer. So let's check that stuff out next. 
Okay, so we learned that yeast is one ingredient that goes into making great beer here at SBC. What you're looking at here is barley, and this barley that I've got here, Brian, is cool looking stuff, but mine yeah. is a lot lighter colored than yours. What's going yeah. on here? That's dark, this is light. What's yeah. up? So, uh, barley is kind of the backbone of the beer, and it's what we use to drive a lot of color and flavor. Um, both of these are two-row barleys, pretty much the exact same product, but this one's just been roasted longer. So really? both of okay. these are going through a, a kilning, K-I-L-N-I-N-G process, okay. to dry the grain out and stabilize it, and also to caramelize some of the sugar. The more you caramelize it, the darker it gets. So this has much more of a coffee, uh, kind of a burnt toffee profile. Oh. This is something you mm. would put into a stout. It does. Although you would still probably have 80% of your recipe be this regular two roast. So it doesn't take a lot of these more complex, darker grains. And the roast varies um, depending on how much you want it. So like a little light uh, Pilsner to something a little more red than that, all the way up to something that's darker than this where it looks almost burnt. Wow. And it tastes and, like and black coffee. That stuff's from England, this stuff's from Canada. Yeah. I want to take the yeast part, the barley part, and learn about how other ingredients are involved. I'm going to talk about that next, so let's do it. So um, to make beer, we got to take that grain that we just looked at, we got to crush it and mill it. So what we have is something that we call a uh, mash tun or a lauter tun. Um, these are all German terms. Basically, this is just a giant tea bag. So that grain comes through this uh, grist auger and it goes through this, which okay. is a grist hydrator. And we hit it with water at about 160 degrees because we want this grain to steep at about 152. That's going to allow the enzymes in the grain to convert all that starch into sugar. That's it's barley. Also, that's okay. right. All right. And it's also going to allow those caramel compounds and those chocolatey compounds to come out if that grain is in there. Um, and it gets the sugar where it needs to be before we need to boil it. So once this is done, after about an hour, yeah. we'll pour it over to our boil kettle. And that's where we'll add hops, mm, Okay. which is the other chief ingredient in beer. And these wow. are pelletized. You can actually get hops in a whole cone flour, or you can get them ground and pelletized. We get the most uh, quality out of this, so we get a lot of resin, a lot of aromatics. Um, but the flowers are nice. They're a little, a little more romantic when you throw those cones in there. Um, this is going to give you a lot of aroma and the bitterness. So if you yeah. throw this into the boil kettle early, it's going to be all bitter. If you throw it in late, you're going to get all aromatics. So mm. part of the recipe is figuring out which hops what flavors you're going to want, what compounds you're going to want, and how to kind of tease those out when we yeah. get to the boil side on the kettle. Take a look at this huge container right here. All of those four ingredients that we mentioned earlier are all in here, and right now that yeast is feasting on all those ingredients, and apparently those byproducts from the yeast is something that Brian is looking for to add to the taste of the beer. So Brian, the stuff is in here. It's fermenting, and Nick Furman loves <laughs> fermenting. It's a good thing, right? So. There, it's all in there. Then what? What is happening from here? Yeah. So we uh, we basically we created a meal for the yeast itself. Uh, all that liquid's pumped into this tank, and it's about 65, 70 degrees is what the yeast that we're using right now likes to live at. Um, and the yeast is chewing on this meal, and the two byproducts that we get off of that are ethanol, which is alcohol, and CO2. Uh, we also get a couple of other aromas and flavors depending on the yeast. So yeast does drive a pretty fair amount. Um, of the overall flavor potential, and like we said earlier, mouthfeel and everything else. Yeah, it's very, yeah. very crucial. So, and the shape of this, mm -hmm. what, what is the shape of this Yeah, about? so this is designed because yeast, when it gets cold, um, it's on our side of the animal kingdom, it wants to clump together. Okay. The yeast doesn't have clothes, so the colder it gets, the more it starts to clump. And just like us, if we all started clumping together and we're in a big body of water, we would start to sink. So this is designed to get that yeast chilly, sink it so that all the solids come into here, and then we can catch that yeast back and use it again. It's called a slurry. It allows us to keep that yeast going. Otherwise, you would just have to dump it off. But we do take the yeast solids and some of the proteins and the hops that settle out, and we'll pump those into our spent grain coat. So the spent grain, where's that going? Throwing it out, or what are you doing? Yeah, with no. It? Luckily, um, spent grain. We have a local farmer that comes and picks up our spent grain. He feeds Good. all of his livestock with it. We pump yeast. We pump hops in there. Even if we have a little extra spent beer, sometimes we'll pump it in there. But we try to get it so that everything's fairly sustainable. We're a very green industry, and we kind of always have been because we grew up with agriculture. It, it's such an important part, and you ended with agriculture. Brian, thank you so much Cheers. for sharing thank all you. this. This Rainy local day. ag, appreciate you being on with me. Y'all check out the Southern Brewing Company website there on the screen, and while you're online, check out the Georgia Farm Monitor Facebook and the Ranger Nick's Facebook page. I love it when you do that. And until next time, for the Farm Monitor, I'm Ranger Nick, as we always say, and enthusiasm is contagious.
So pass it on. Cheers. Y'all, thanks so much for watching. We'll look forward to seeing you when we get back together again next month. See ya. Cheers. Very cool. Thank you so much, Nick. Well, boy, how things have changed over the years, including how quilts are made. When we come back, meet a lady who's been doing it for a long time and why she feels being a member of the Quilting Guild is very important. As many of you know, quilting is an art form that's been passed down for many generations, but what used to be a way to keep your family warm is now a hobby for most. We recently visited a quilting guild in Augusta and spoke to the vice president as she talked about what has changed over the years and how guilds are keeping the art alive. I'm Marie Atkinson. I'm president, vice president of the Peaceful Hearts Quilt Guild. We meet in North Augusta, South Carolina. We have members all over the area. I've been a member since 1997, been quilting for over 20 years. Um, we have about 130 members. We meet on Mondays and Thursdays every week. We have um, workshops and we have social bees and we have so, uh, covered dish luncheons and we have all kind of fun activities. Right, a quilt bee, quilt bee, back in like the you know early days of quilting, was where a group of women got together to quilt one quilt. And they had a wooden frame that the quilt was wrapped around or strapped to or clamped to some fashion. And they sat and they hand sewed that quilt, the three layers of the quilt together. Um, and because it is so time consuming, they were able to get it done in one or two days. Whereas with uh, today, a quilt bee is totally social where we come together, we're working on our own projects, and we are still meeting for that social aspect. So the, one of the best things about quilting is the social aspect. Meet new friends and, um, you know, I've got lifelong friends now here in the Guild that, you know, I've made from being here so long. Being a member of a Guild is very important. When I self-taught, there were things I didn't know I was doing wrong. And if I felt frustrated, I had nobody to ask. So with being a member of a guild, we get together, we share not only what we've done, but we share frustrations and we share, how can I do this better? And that also helps me as an officer of the guild know what classes and workshops to line up with you know, our groups to help learn, help them to teach, help teach them how to learn to do whatever they're trying to do better. Quilting is not just what a woman does anymore to make a cover for her family. It is so much more, and yes, there is the hobby side of it, but it's also a very big, um, it is some people's careers. The teaching, um, the, hand, the quilting for others. Um, there are a lot of people who want to quilt, but they don't want to make it. So the quilters today have the opportunity to make quilts, custom quilts for people. And the tools we have today make that way more easy to do than say in the 70s when I started. Because in the 70s when I started, you had to take a, a template of either paper or cardboard, transfer that pattern to that template, and then cut around it. And it was very, very time consuming. Quilting is about passion. And so if you want to learn to quilt, it doesn't matter whether you're man, woman, child. I've taught children to quilt. It, it's not about your economic status. Because trust me, if you don't have the money to buy fabric, we have lots we'll share. Very cool. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening out on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed, see what's up in the world of farming, plus here at the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week.